I'm really glad to do this talk about practice makes perfect when it comes to RxJS, because I really think that RxJS is not really a huge problem when it comes to developing Angular application. It's more like establishing a reactive mindset. And I want to really help you with this talk to establish that reactive mindset. And in the very end, I also want to give a brief outlook uh, about RxJS 7 and what we plan for the new upcoming releases. So first things first, maybe you remember a similar situation when you were a little child, children and you first time ride a bicycle. At least for me, it was very similar like in this GIF. Instead of hitting a tree, I hit the fence of my neighbor. So my mom was taking a helmet and before she came back, I completely hit that. Um, and this is totally fine, but you usually, even though you might fail at the very beginning, you don't stop riding a bicycle. You just go up in it the next time, try it more. And that's actually how you should do it for RxJS as well. Because after a while practicing, you become really professional with it, like, like really professional. I mean, this little girl nailed it here. And I really can't stress it enough. It's, for RxJS, it's completely the same. Like you have a continuous cycle of practicing and understanding stuff. And every time you practice stuff, you will understand more about the nitty gritty details about RxJS. And before we dig deeper into that talk, I want to do some two words about me. So my name is Niklas Wortmann. Since yesterday, I'm the self-employed consultant for Angular and RxJS applications. Um, since mid of 2018, I think, I'm a member of the RxJS core team. I'm also organizing a little meetup in nearby Dusseldorf in Germany. And if you don't want to talk to me about Angular or RxJS or JavaScript or whatever, that's totally fine for me. I also love talking about steak and whiskey. So just hit me a direct message on Twitter or something like that. And we can just chat about steak and whiskey. I love that. So that was everything I have about me. One minor information as well. In mid of March, there's the RxJS live conference in London where most of the RxJS core team is as well. And if I remember correctly, Angular Leon is also a community partner. So you should definitely check that out. The speaker lineup is amazing. And it's going to be a great conference. I can, can't stress it enough. So check it out. And I would happy to meet you there. OK, back to the talk. So when we start looking at your RxJS, we came across all those fancy, fancy terms. And at the very beginning, it's really overwhelming. Like It sounds like everything is super important. Let's, Minor or decent spoiler, it's not like, I don't know half of these terms. Well, probably I don't, did, but it doesn't matter. So it's really, there's a shitload of stuff in RxJS that you can use, but you don't have to be to be for professional. There's a lot of stuff that is for minor edge cases that are barely used anymore. So don't feel overwhelmed by it. It's not really, it's not really, it shouldn't be a problem for you. And once a very wise man said to me, like, observables don't cause problem. Establishing a reactive mindset does. I'm actually not sure who it was, but this is really like key of this talk because observables are quite easy. If you take a look at the implementation and if you try to um, don't look at all the edge cases, it's like very easy implementation. It's within 30 lines of code, you can implement an observable on your own. But having this reactive mindset to Establish a way of thinking that you need to use all the operators. That's really difficult. And maybe it's, it's very similar actually to learning a foreign language because most of the people I know, at least that come from, uh, from university before, were familiar with object oriented programming and reactive programming is a completely different thing. So for me, it was when I learned a foreign language, my first foreign language was English. I also once learn French, but well, that didn't work out well. <laughs> so I stick to English here. It's definitely better for all of us. Um, so what I want to emphasize here is that if you learn a foreign language, you will notice that some of the terms sounds really similar. So even though without knowing the words, you might actually understand what it means. So in German, we have this hello, which is hello. So the sound is already similar. It's already also similar written, and it's quite easy. There are also words that are completely the same for different reason. And also, if you try to translate things directly, especially when we're talking about sayings, it doesn't make any kind of sense. So for example, in Germany, we have this saying of an Ohrwurm, which 
It's like if you have a song stuck in your head and you keep singing that and can't get it out of your head, this is like an album. And if you translate it to in English, it would mean earworm, which sounds super disgusting and just totally gross. So this is like what I meant. It doesn't make any sense to apply this directly. And if we're talking about imperative and reactive uh, programming, it's very similar. So if we are doing imperative stuff, for example, what we are doing is like accessing the first element of an array. We're using the index signature. So we're using array at index per, uh, zero and using reactive approaches for something similar, like applying the first operator. That's kind of convenient. That's also not super obvious, but manageable. Um, there's also stuff that's completely the same. So there the analogy is very good. Like filter and map are completely the same. Also for different kinds of reasons that within the RxJS library, we want to provide stuff that is already understandable. But if you look at some stuff like, or try to apply stuff like if operations, like conditional stuff, then things get out of hand. And doing this in a reactive approach, actually it's not really reactive to say something like, okay, if this and that, it's not reactive. Uh, so this is stuff where it's really difficult to apply that properly. Um, what I want to emphasize here, it's not, if you learn a foreign language, it's not that you can do that within days and you're professional with it. You have to practice that. You have to learn vocabulary. You have to do stuff. You have to learn grammar. I'm super bad at grammar, by the way. And you have to uh, keep doing that to be professional with that and get better and better every day. And it just needs practice. And therefore, because I'm also super bad at designing slides, what I want to do is like do a shitload of live coding now. Uh, and what I actually want to do is like implement a uh, Caruso. So where we have uh, swipe gestures, I could also use touch gestures here. Uh, I have keyboard navigation. And after a certain timer hits, it also goes to the next slide. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, this is what we are going to implement in a very reactive approach. So let's take a look at the code. I hope it's big enough because I don't get any feedback. I just I will increase it once. And then I just assume it's big enough. So uh, I will, in, like after this talk, I will publish the slides, or at least a similar version of the slides on Twitter. Uh, so if you want to take a look at the code and on the slides again, just check out my Twitter account. There will, it will be. So. I already prepared a little bit about the code because I'm actually not able to write everything here completely out of my head. So let's start at the very top where we have our touch start observable. And because we want to actually to support touch and mouse gestures, we are just merging them because they are working very similar. Uh, don't get confused by this prevent, prevent event propagation. It's just there because otherwise it would trigger my slides to go to the next slide. So this. It would work without that it's just for because I wanted to integrate it in my slides. So here I'm just merging those two events um, and triggering the animation. What I want to do is if we're thinking about the swipe gesture, what it is is like actually it has an initial starting point. So as soon as we touch down, our observable is starting. And it's living as on or we are interested in the values of all the touch move in between until we release the mouse. That's pretty much what we want to implement. And so therefore, within our touch start, what we need is to apply the switch map operator. Um, I'm actually not going to elaborate on all the operators in detail. If you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me afterwards on Twitter or something like that. I'm happy to answer all the questions about those. And what I'm doing here is like applying the um, start event and pass it to a touch move function here. So there I pass the start event. We will need that for some of the calculations. And so what I'm doing here within the touch move is that I'm already uh, merging touch move and mouse move events. And additionally, here I'm using the observe on operator to use the animation frame scheduler. So every time the browser is idle, uh, we will trigger the animation later. This is like a decent performance optimization if you want to. Look. The animation should look a little bit smoother. Uh, so here I pass animation frame scheduler. And what I also want to do is apply the take until operator here. Uh, so I could also do it on the very end. For this, it doesn't make any difference. There are some edge cases where it does, but 
Um, we're good. So for convenience reason, I also use the race operator here because we're just inter interested in one. It should either be a touch up, no, a touch end or a mouse up event, which we are interested in. So if therefore we are using from event again, native element, um, touch end and from event, native element, mouse up. Exactly. So as soon as one of those um, emits something, we will unsubscribe from our touch move event. This is good. So to keep doing, what we now need to do is calculate the delta, like from the start point to the end point, and do a, a minor animation there. And because I'm absolutely not able to, any, uh, to code this live, I prepared a little helper function, which is called calculate delta. And there I have to pass the start event and the items. Items is whatever that was. Uh, items is just a reference to the uh, images that are passed within the carousel. Uh, so if we took a quick look here, what we are just doing is like getting the X coordinate, calculating the delta, and triggering the animation. This is everything we're doing. So back to the actual position where we was, because what would now happen is that we emit every step in between, like every touch move event would, uh, would be emitted to our subscriber. But we are just interested in the very last value so that we can see at the very end. So as soon as our complete signal comes in, we just get, emit the latest value so that we can see is a threshold hit so that we say, okay, go to the next page or not. And therefore we are just using take last one. Um, um, so because I prepared already that we, the, or at least a little bit, the left and right arrow navigation, I combined those in an events observable. So here I will apply that with swipe. Uh, later on, I will add the other ones. And what I just here is exactly what I described, like checking if the threshold is hit. If so, go to the next or the previous page, animate everything, and for sure unsubscribe as soon as our component is destroyed. So this is all is wrapped inside an Angular application. So you can check it out afterwards and see what I did. So let's take a look if this is working actually already. So I hope it does. OK. So you already see like the animation. And I'm actually using my mouse, but I just assume touch is working as well. Um, so let's take a look at the left and right arrow navigation, because that's actually very straightforward now. So we are also just using the from event operator with this time because keyboard events are emitted to the document as long as it doesn't have any kind of focus. So therefore, we are just using document. This would not work if you're using server-side rendering, but that's the fact I, for now, didn't uh, cover it properly. So it's totally fine, more or less. And we're interested in all the key down events here. And what we're doing with those key down events, like we are filtering out everything that is not uh, left or right arrow, or in my example, I used A and D because left and right arrow would also trigger my slides. Uh, keyboard event. Also, one information here, the from event operator is not super good type. So for now, it just says it returns an observable of event like you see here in the signature. And by applying the cast, you can also access all the proper fields. Uh, so here we say event. I always forgot, I think it's code or is it key code? Deal. I think it's like this. I think it's code. OK, we will find out. Um, anyway, if this condition is hit, we're not interested in the event. We're interested just in the signal itself. So therefore, we can apply map to and say, go to next page. No, go to previous page for uh, left arrow. And go to pref page is just a constant, which is one less than the threshold. So it's not a huge deal here. Uh, before I will copy over all the needed stuff for the right arrow, I will check if I did that correctly, because I always forgot about key A. OK, it works. So you might not see that properly, but I'm just using the keyboard and it works. So let's copy that over for um, the right arrow which is actually the D key and not the arrow key. Um, 
And here, instead of key A, we say key D. And here, instead of go to prep page, we say go to um, go to next page. So one slide information from event every time you're using that will register a window at event listener under the hood. So we could use the share operator here and have like a shared observable for that. Um, I'm actually not sure. I would have to apply performance tests for that if it's more performant to store all the values in the subject and subscribe once to that or have two event listeners. Um, it's definitely not a huge deal. So as soon, sorry for swiping around. I have no clue where I'm in right now. Uh, here, exactly. So now let's add right arrow again. And then if we go to the application, we should be able to go to all the other slides. So this was very convenient for now. So what I now want to do, and this is really cool, like implement a timer. But what we need to do is for that timer, we have to reset the timer as soon one of those events is emitted. Because otherwise, if we just say, OK, go to the next slide every five seconds, this would be totally distracting if you go to the next one. And immediately afterwards, it would jump to the next one. So we start with an interval. And interval is nothing but a set, tie, uh, set interval under the hood. Um, but what we want to do is we are just interested in the interval until our events observable emit something. Um, but this would now cause our, pro, um, our observable to complete, what we also don't want. We want it to restart. And what we can do here is apply the repeat when operator. So repeat when is triggered as soon as our observable completes. And we get a notify observable in there. And this notify observable, every time our observable completes, will have an emission. And if, we, if the observable return here emits something, we will resubscribe to that. So we can just return the notifier observable here again. What happened now is every time we our observable completes, it will resubscribe again. So pretty much those two lines is just could also be like a custom operator resubscribe when. Uh, so as soon as this hits, we would resubscribe. This is actually quite cool. And what we now just need to do is again go to the next page. So if I didn't make any mistake, and I also already pre uh, merged that in our time uh, in our observable where we subscribe to in the end. So if I didn't make any mistake, it should go to the next slide after five seconds automatically. Um, this is already very nice, and it also works. So if I now go to the previous one, it will re um, restart the time and therefore wait again for five seconds. Um, also, one minor thing I want to do is apply a tab operator, because what would now happen just by applying go to next page <coughs> uh, is that as soon as or we would basically exceed the active counter, like exceeding the maximum limit. So what we want to do is if we are already at the very maximum at the very end, we just want to say, OK, go to the first slide again. So therefore, I have. A function prepared, which was like animate back to first slides slide, where I have to pass the items in there. And this should now, if I go to the last slide and our five seconds timer is hit, it show instead of going to the next page, go to the first one. Ta da! Amazing. So, um, also, one thing that I would like to stress here is most of the time, I don't write code in the subscribe logic. I, if I want to write code there, I just use a tab operator. So you can also apply for tab uh, next hour and complete function, which is not really well known. So you have the complete same signature than you then uh, subscribe, but by without having a logic in the subscribe, you are at any point of time able to use the async part within Angular, which is super nice and super cool. <clears throat> um, so this was one thing I want to stress. And this is pretty much everything I prepared for the live coding. To make it a little bit more clear, I will take a quick look at the chat if there's an issue. No, it's not. That's great. Um, so I will give a quick summary about the code that we just talked about. And afterwards, talk about the cool stuff of RHS 7. Perfect timing. OK, so we started with merging all the events together. So all the events that have a similar uh, behavior, we merge them together. In this case, we are treating touch and mouse events 
completely dissimilar. Uh, one thing to notice is because basically you could have uh, multi-touch gestures, you will always get a touch array out of that. So for now, I would I just use uh, the first touch event, but it, it doesn't really matter for now. Um, so afterwards, we applied switch map. What would happen now is if you would apply actually multi-touch gestures that the last one wins. That's actually how switch map is working. Um, and every time a touch start happens, we are subscribing to our touch move event. Um, and the touch move consists out of touch move or mouse move events until, oh no, sorry. First we are doing minor performance tweaks with applying the animation frame scheduler. There's a really great talk about schedulers on YouTube by Michael Lutke. So if you're not familiar with it, check that out. It's really in-depth. Um, and we're interested in our mouse move events or touch move events until we either have a mouse up or a touch end. <coughs> Sorry, I need to drink something before going on. Uh, so here is the actual code of the mm, delta calculation. It's not super fancy fancy. It's just like taking the start point and the end point and all the time calculating the delta and go on with that. And in the very end, as soon as our complete signal hits, we are just forward emitting the last value that happened before. So therefore, here we are just merging all the events together to have a combined view on that. This is what I meant before, like having minor performance optimization, because later on, we again subscribe to the events observable. By applying share, we have like, we probably have a decent performance optimization. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not really noticeable, but just for you to know as a minor hack, like it's not really a hack, this is a very good operator. Um, yeah. So to go on, for sure, we again applying merge here, having the inside the tab logic, everything we would do in our subscribe, which is pretty much just check if the threshold is met and go to the next page or the previous one. And <clears throat> Don't forget to subscribe and also don't forget to unsubscribe. So this is covered by these two lines. That's great. So let's take a look at the keyword navigation. <coughs> Sorry. So the keyword um, navigation was implemented by using from event as well, uh, checking for the key down event. And here we are filtering out all the emissions that are not of key code A. And if it's key A, then we go to the previous page and the same goes for going to the next page, which is just checking for key D. And if so, go to the next page. And the cool thing now is because we have all the logic already in place for hitting animations, checking for thresholds and everything. It was really just like hitting the threshold, merging it into our observable. Okay, here's also for some reason the actual threshold logic, it's nothing special. Um, but by merging it into that observable, we were able to don't apply any further logic and it was immediately working. I just added the three lines of code per either left or right arrow and we were good to go. So this is one of the strengths of RxOS, like it's, that it's really amazing if you want to extend new features. Um, so this for that, uh, again, uh, triggering subscribe and so on and so forth. Let's talk about the timer thingy because that was actually quite interesting from my point of view. So we're using interval. We could also have used timer. That's not a huge difference there. Um, we are checking for take until. So as soon as one of the events is emitting, we will unsubscribe from our interval or we will complete our interval and immediately we'll resubscribe to that. This is like a really nice pattern from my point of view for this mechanism. By applying map to go to next page, so every time our interval is emitting something, which just happens after five seconds, we would say go to next page. And this piece of code is just there for if we, if our active page would be bigger than or is bigger or equal to the maximum items, then go to the first page instead. Nothing special. Again, it's merged in there so that we actually are subscribing to our time observable and all the logic that is already in place is triggered. So if there are, well, actually, I don't know if there are questions. 
if there are questions about the code, feel free to reach out to me. That's pro probably the easiest way to deal with that. Otherwise, now I would talk about the stuff that we plan for version 7 and beyond. So right now, we are in the alpha candidate for IHS 7. So I think we recently released alpha 1 or something like that. So if you would like to help us, try to or check it out, see if everything works for you. I'm right now not aware of huge breaking changes. So if you don't have used any deprecated code or something like that, you should be totally good to go. <clears throat> and we did three things that are great for you. And we would one thing that is great for us. So let's talk first about the thing that is great for us, because I will not go super much into detail about that. But we are actually planning to change a little bit about the architecture in version 8 to have a better performance and a smaller bundle size provided with the, in the RxS library. And um, so this is what we plan right now. And to not have like huge breaking changes, we are, Ben has already uh, made a proof of concept for that. And you can check it out on GitHub. I think the branch for that is like mutable subscriber, something like that called. So if you want to check it out, go to GitHub. Um, but it would introduce a lot of breaking changes if we would do it without a step in between. So therefore, right now we are applying minor breaking changes. And then with version 8, we are again providing minor breaking changes, probably. So th at least this is a plan right now. So additionally, for people that are using TypeScript, we improved the typings a lot. So this is quite nice. This was also one of the requirements to be able to run in Google G3. So now every Google project that is working with, RX, uh, with RxJS is using the latest GitHub. So this is really nice for us. It's like a huge quality gate. Additionally, we provide an animation frame observable, which is super nice. If you want to use that, please reach out to us because we are a little bit on the fence and already discussed we might remove that before releasing RxJS 7 because the test scheduler is not working with that. And you would not assume that just by having a testing util that is not working with all the parts of the other library. Yeah, that's a little bit weird. So, um, but it's definitely an amazing feature. And if you want to use it, reach out to us. It would be great feedback. Additionally, people that used to work with RxS 5 were familiar with Concat, mer Concat with, Merge with, like having pipeable operators for these Concat operations. So for now, you just have a creation operator, Concat, uh, but it's not really usable. So with Concat with, we will improve the ergonomy of that. And we also very recently merged zip with and merge with and stuff like that. So I will show how this will look in code later on. So let's talk about the typings that we improved. So especially within NGRX applications, it's quite common to have like a switch map and have a certain condition. And if so, return one observable. And if not, return another of another type. Like if online perform an HTTP request, if not, don't perform it. Stuff like that. Return a cache value. Um, actually, for switch map, it was fixed before version 7. But there were different scenarios where we are expecting a function to return an observable, and we are not expecting there to be a conditional type. So before version 7, uh, this would lead to an observable of object. And afterwards, it properly inferred the type so that it's either an observable of string or number by applying this. Um, union type here. So this is now properly inferred. This is really nice. So every, every operator that takes a function which returns a new observable is now checking if there could be a condition and infer the type properly. Let's talk about concat because most of the people won't hit that limit. But if you had a certain limit of uh, observables passed into concat, it would just infer to observable of unknown, which is not really helpful. Actually, I didn't knew there was an unknown type before. Um, but with version 7, we fixed that. So now it's properly inferred to I don't know how many observables. Um, probably, you won't use something like that. But if so, we are not, you're not covered. Also, we changed a little bit about scan and reduce. And Actually, I noticed recently that array reduce is working the same way. So if you are casting your accumulator function to a certain type, in this case, I, we used any, um, it assumes the return value to be of type any, which kind of makes sense to use the accumulator to infer the type. But if we take a look at the return type in the function, there's actually no reason that this can't be string. In any 
value that is within uh, the, it has to be a string. So with RxS 7, this is not properly inferred that we say, okay, this will be of observable string before it inferred the type of the accumulator. Uh, last thing about the typings, and this is really making me happy. So we added the Boolean constructor function to the filter signature. So now you're able to pass the Boolean constructor function and this will infer the type properly. Before, because we didn't expect it, we just said, okay, we don't know how it's happened, even though by filtering out values, it doesn't change the signature or the return type of the observable. Um, but it was a thing that was not expecting. And also array filter is working the same way. So um, also if you're applying type gods, there are some gotchas that you're not assuming, but yeah. So this is about the TypeScript stuff. Again, if you're not TypeScript, well, it's your own fault. You should use TypeScript. Um, let's talk about the animation frame observable because this is really cool. So um, anytime the animation frame is hit, so every time the browser is idle, it will emit the elapsed milliseconds. And you can actually use that to build, who would guess that, beautiful animations. <clears throat> so you could build stuff like a tween function, for example, which is taking that um, uh, calculating, calculating, what, speaking is difficult, calculating a div, applying this animation frame of um, schedule, animation frame observable to implement something like this, uh, something like that. For example, we're having a diff placed somewhere on our page that doesn't really matter what it is. And by using this screen operator that I just wrote before, we can uh, change the position of our diff in a very performant way. And this would actually look like this. And depending on the input delay of the Beamer and the internet connection, this might not look really good. I already covered that at some talks, but on my screen, it really looks nice. So I will do it again. Just just in case you might not saw it properly. So you see it, it's really flawlessly. This animation is super beautiful. It's super performant. It's really nice. I, I love this animation frame observable. So I really would like to have that in RxS core. Last thing I want to show is the concat operator and especially concat with, because we will actually add zip with, merge with, et cetera, et cetera. So before, you have just the creation operator concat. And the API ergonomy is not really good because as soon as this observable completes, it will subscribe to that. But if you have logic that is just applied to that observable and not to that, then it's getting out of hand because here you have then to say pipe, do this and this operator. And then you say like here, you can use like this and that operator. So it blows the code a lot and it's not really readable from my point of view. By using concat with, you can have all the operators that you want to apply to the hello observable just before the concat with. And afterwards you say concat with world, apply all the operators there, and then you're good to go. The, it's much more readable from my point of view. So I'm really looking forward to have all these <coughs> combination operators covered with a similar way that this, it just improves the API economy from my point of view. But it will, so we will, if I remember correctly, deprecate concat so that it's going to be removed in version eight, but I'm not entirely sure right now to be fully honest. But anyway, this is what we plan for concat with, which is already in alpha one and zip with and stuff like that will be in the next alpha or beta or whatever. Okay, let's give a very, very, very quick summary and then we're good to go. So. The thing I want you to, to take out with this talk is like, it's just the fact that to get professional with RxJS, to dig deeper into that, you don't have to learn all the operators for half. It doesn't make any sense. You have to build stupid stuff. And it doesn't really matter what kind of stupid stuff that is. It can also be just implementing the same. So within the source code repository, there's the working code and the, um, like the basic sketch that I used to start with. Um, you could also, do similar stuff like drag and drop is very similar just from an architectural point of view. Uh, you can also implement like a type head stuff, search stuff. So this is just some kind of suggestion that you could start with uh, because type head is like the RxS 101. And a really cool one from my point of view is like long polling. So after every 10 seconds or something like that, fetch data from an API resource until a certain condition is matched. So there are different approaches to deal with that problem within RxJS. 
And all the approaches have several benefits and other benefits. So I can really recommend implementing stuff like that on your own just to get more familiar, feel more um, familiar within the RxJS code base. And so here's a link to the slides. So you can, it's a similar version. So you can, uh, with RxJS dash practice dash perf makes dash perfect dot dev, you will get access to the slide. And with this bit.ly link, you will get access to the GitHub repository. I will wait for a second till you did a screenshot or something like that, but I will also publish the slides on Twitter or make a link or something like that. So just for you to know, if you want to make a picture, this is definitely the slide you want to make a picture of. If not, just check out my Twitter profile. And this is pretty much everything I've prepared so far. I'm really thankful for having me, even though I was just able to do a remote talk. It, it was definitely really nice. And if you have any kind of question afterwards, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, mail, whatever. I'm really happy to help at any point of time. So with observe on, you actually postpone the point of time where the value is emitted forward. So you could, for example, which is far more easier to get than the animation frame observer scheduler is the async scheduler, which just use set timeout under the hood. So by using observe on an async scheduler, you could say like, okay, postpone the emission for n seconds. Um, with subscribe on, you could say you can postpone the point of time of the subscription. So uh, to make that more easily to guess, uh, to grasp what this does. So for example, I have implemented a select box with RxJS and I opened the select box and the, all the options were animated, but I still wanted to subscribe to the click event so that I know if one of those is clicked, but I don't want to do stuff like, okay, set timeout. Then therefore I use the subscribe on to say like, okay, wait for the animation to happen. And after one of those subscribe on any kind of click events happening on that. So it's really just there to either postpone the point of time where the value is emitted or the point of time where we are subscribing to our observable. 